Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, group four. Uh, so this uh, group has got exciting five talks, uh, and then there will be a Crosswick uh, Brex Rexes Town Hall, and then we're going to start planning for 2021 after. The first talk is going to be about medical and health and wearables. It's going to be given by Mark uh, Pollock from Binghamton University. Uh, this is a, a collaboration between us at Binghamton, uh, Jan Vardaman, TechSearch, uh, Garish, uh, Jabel, uh, Nancy, and colleagues at GE. Uh, Suresh at Georgia Tech and Scott Miller at NextFlex. In fact, uh, the chapter is about uh, 22 pages uh, and uh, is about to be released. So finally, that's out. Uh, in the past, we've been presenting about a variety of uh, modalities um, for healthcare where heterogeneous integration systems are uh, certainly key. And so there's a long future to develop this chapter. Uh, much, much more broadly than uh, what we're taking right now. And our focus right now is wearables. And I can certainly point out, as I mentioned at the bottom, uh, the current pandemic has created a significant need and drive for wearable monitoring uh, that will support both clinical home and personal care. Uh, so if we haven't learned the lesson before, we've certainly learned it now uh, that, uh, you know, the onset of more intelligent uh, telemedicine is, is clearly the future. And so in this chapter, we focus uh, initially, of course, in this phase on human health monitoring uh, for vital signs and, and other factors, uh, and uh, eventually for diagnostic systems. In fact, this is the uh, chart that Bill carried to the NSF on that particular topic. Uh, another thing to point out is uh, we all know uh, wearable gadgets as being widely available, uh, but only uh, you know having relative accuracy. Uh, we don't really rely on our our doctor's appointment to inform them what our, our smartwatch might have told us about our heart rate. Uh, obviously, we need clinical grade equipment for that. And so the idea is to build upon uh, the technology that's in these wearable devices to make them uh, Band-Aid-like, but yet uh, suitable of providing clinical quality information. And certainly uh, us at Binghamton, uh, together with Professor Ghosh uh, in particular, have been working on such devices. But of course, other places have been doing the same. Another th one thing that's very, very clear in you know, looking at various roadmaps and surveys as we prepared the chapter is the future is stretchability. The future is conformality. Uh, the future is to provide all of these various functions, including fluidic analysis into wearable patches. Uh, very key to this are materials, uh, substrates, and of course, all the materials that go into the device <coughs> ways to package them, uh, and all forms of devices, including RF and optical, and we said fluidic and uh, motion sensors, uh, power, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, here today, I'd like to give you a, a realm because as part of our roadmap table, which you might have seen before, uh, together with NextFlex, uh, we've been working with a company called Liquid Wire, made to move, uh, which has uh, developed a, a liquid metal gel consisting of gallium, indium, and tin. And this literally uh, material can be uh, dispensed, extruded, and printed uh, to form conductors that have uh, less than an uh, ohm in resistance after uh, tens of thousands of cycles up to strains of 100%. So clearly, when we start looking at the details of our roadmap, and there's no time to go into all the details, and look under, under uh, substrates and the associated printed inks, you know, this was uh, clearly a future objective. But this is a company that's making this and providing samples to companies, to other companies to, uh, to integrate into their devices. So I think this is a real opportunity we're going to see coming in the, in the near term, uh, truly stretchable conductors. Uh, the white paper looked at a variety of literature sources and things we know from work done in Professor Arias' lab and a, a nice uh, review on, on uh, heterogeneous integration based on the flexible hybrid electronics approach, uh, wearable patches uh, that uh, collect moisture or perform analysis, uh, and of course, electrical stimulation to promote wield, wound development. Uh, these two examples I pointed out in my previous talk, but just imagine, simple enough said, you know, going from a sleep apnea test where you're wired like this to something that can be done at home. And that's really among the, the virtues that this uh, technology has to offer. Uh, the medical objectives of these things include all of the uh, parameters listed here, and we won't get into that. Uh, communications are key, the ability to print antennas, or for that matter, uh, simple RF devices uh, would also help to reduce cost. And of course, energy. 
uh, and they, they need for batteries and batteries that are, are uh, have high power, uh, but are also safe and in very small form factors are key. And it's becoming clear that, you know, maybe lithium ion batteries will not achieve that or be the one to do that uh, in the next flex or rather the flex tech conference that was also this week in its last day today. Uh, there was a great session on uh, batteries and energy and looking at alternate forms, in particular solid state batteries, which can actually be very small, very compact and probably not flexible, but much easier to integrate than many of the coin cells that are used today. I won't get into the details about circuitization, non-printing components and the device assembly. Uh, this is all in the roadmaps that we've tried to uh, list out. Uh, in addition, uh, roadmaps have needs, and one of the biggest need is that this technology points to uh, minimally packaged dye. And so the, the whole need to get these dye and to convince suppliers, and some have stepped up to it, like our friends at Analog Devices in particular, uh, to provide dye for this kind of work, uh, where these thin dye can be uh, integrated to equally thin substrates. In fact, almost uh, invisible substrates, such as the work by Professor Rogers at Northwestern, uh, where these components are placed onto metal meshes and then applied to skin in the form of a tattoo and powered entirely uh, by uh, RF antennas uh, using near field, uh, both communications and power sources. Uh, clearly, a, a remarkable opportunities exist in this area. Uh, we have also provided a roadmap for the wearable technologies that include uh, all of the parameters listed in the columns on the left. Uh, clearly one thing we're gonna start to see uh, is not only uh, picking up electrical signals from the body or stimulating the body with electrical signals, but also uh, collecting fluids, uh, whether it be the perspiration on the skin or the fluids below the skin, the so-called interstitial fluids, which often uh, contain markers uh, that indicate uh, the presence of disease or some kind of a, a um, inflammation in the body, uh, indicating uh, the potential of an infection. So uh, the conclusions are expressed here. I believe I've covered them uh, pretty much in the high points of my talk. Uh, I'd like to thank all those uh, co-authors who participated and those, especially Wilford and Jason, formerly from NextFlex, who helped to, me to kick this off at the beginning. Uh, and thank you all. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, or good evening, or good morning. And I am Jose Stene, and I'm chairing the co-design uh, chapter. My co-chair is Chris Bailey. Actually, this, this chapter is an extension of the modeling and simulation chapter that is uh, headed by, by Chris. All right, and, and, of, and of course, uh, we have an extensive uh, group of uh, contributors from industry and academia that have helped us uh, construct the eight sections of the chapter. Uh, the purpose of the chapter is we need to add, there's some questions that we have to address that we need to address then. Uh, basically, the challenges we, uh, associated with, with code design and uh, some of these challenges relate to the multi-physics nature of, of, of co-design, as well as the multi-level uh, nature of co-design and um, um, the algorithms, uh, the, the, to the modeling and simulation usually is done in the form of, co of analysis. And the idea of doing the design is kind of like working on the, the reverse problem. You know, how do you optimize how do you design these systems in such a way that you account for the multiple constraints? And questions we address are things like, uh, can artificial intelligence help, for instance? And we also, looking at the chapter, we see that there are several new technologies and or mix of technologies that uh, we're looking into. So uh, as far as how could design can, can help optimize these technologies, things like uh, silicon photonics, quantum computing, CERDES, novel architecture, et cetera. So there's a lot of questions that, uh, you know, that, that, that we address. Now, looking at the traditional code design, it basically goes, it, it addresses the idea of taking a chip, putting it on a package and then on a board. So that's the traditional code design because we know that at the chip level, it's a, it's a, everything obeys Moore's law. And the type of uh, the, the type of tools that you use are SPICE, for it, it, which is which stands for simulation program for integrated with integrated circuit emphasis. 
And now at the at the chip level, everything scales according to Moore's law. So the technology node is what determines everything. Now, of course, when you move to the next level, which is the package, it's a different world because you're dealing with copper interconnects that are not as lossy as, as at the chip level. And at that level, everything really scales with the with the wavelength. So the wavelength or the frequency is really what matters. So it's a completely uh, different approach. And then you move on to the board. At the board level, it's an even the wavelengths are even larger, and um, and yet uh, the, the 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 scaling there is completely different than what happens at the chip level. So the idea is that how do you combine these three different levels of integration into one? Because the the challenge is they are they are, uh, are constraints and and trade offs that must be taken into account as you as you go from one level, the other uh, trade-offs related to power, related to bandwidth. Usually these two, these two aspects are extremely important in de designing electronic systems. And, and, and you, you, you need to look at the translation for those different domains. And uh, how do you propagate information in going from the package to the chip to the board? Uh, how do you manage connectivity? Meaning how do you keep track of of the, the, the routing, the, the, the bump mapping, the, the, the pins, et cetera. And, and given the fact that these three different domains deal with different, you know, dealing with different cultures, like for instance, uh, at the chip level, people use certain types of, uh, of, of, of database, like they may use Excel sheets, whereas at the package level, they use a completely different um, way of tabulating the data. So the question is, how do you work together how do they work? How do these three uh, different levels work together in a unified format? So, so how, or, or for that matter, how do we put that in place? Uh, and of course, keep, we keep in mind that the purpose of the, of the work map is to predict and, and, and somehow um, anticipate what is needed for the technology in the years to come. And one, yes, pardon me? Three minutes, thank you. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, uh, should be done in two minutes. Uh, pathfinding is essentially the uh, holy grail for uh, for for co-design, and uh, the the pathfinding tool is in essence is in essence an optimizer or some type of an expert system that will provide a reliable design flow in which not only the performance will be optimized but also the cost and other other parameters such as uh, time to market, and all of those are taken into account. Now, and of course, the goal in, in, in our project here in the chapter is to somehow survey what the current state of the art is and what is needed for the, for the EDA industry uh, to, you know, to take on uh, pathfinding. Now, there are two new additions from the, the 2019 uh, edition. We've added a section on, on thermal uh, aware code design in which, uh, in fact, that was done by, uh, uh, Rohit Sharma, and he addresses joule heat, heating, thermal, uh, electrothermal migration, and thermal stress. So the above points essentially, and what we have here is that the electrical thermal code design can be seen as a systematic approach in, in achieving uh, improved electrical performance in, in 3D or 2.5D systems. You look at things like on chip to chip, to chip PCB interposers, et cetera. Uh, and at the same time, you want to enhance the reliability and minimize the overall system level power and thermal budget. Uh, we also added a section on code design for chiplets and that was done by Wendem uh, Bayon. And uh, as we know, we've had several talks on, on chiplets. They offer you know, the manufacturers in a more efficient way of uh, achieving die scaling and, and they, you know, chiplets can facilitate heterogeneous integration by combining different types of technologies such as silicon and gallium arsenide. Um, however, in the current 2.5D chiplet system, you know, each chiplet is often designed independently as a, as a single unit. And then the chiplets are mounted on an interposer or a package to form a heterogeneous system. And there is very little co-optimization or chip interposer package uh, design. So, uh, so this design approach is not op optimal. 
So the that section in the, in our you know chapter looks into the possibilities of of improving the the design flow by by using co-design techniques and um, for for improving things like system performance, power, chip to chip <coughs> communication, etc. Okay. Uh, now moving forward. What Just we say, I think we were out of time. Would you like to try to wrap up, please? Yeah, this is my last uh, slide. Thank you. Uh, so these are the things we want to do with the with the uh, uh, increase interactions with other uh, twigs, increase cross references to other chapters, modeling, and especially the modeling and simulation twig. And we also would like to interact with the high performance computing uh, twig uh, for, for hardware, software, co analysis. And we would like to increase participation from EDA companies. And also, uh, it'd be good to get some feedback from other twigs as to how we can contribute to their chapters. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. Let's appreciate it. I think- uh, Yeah, I'm here. I'm, I'm on. Here. Hey, excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Mia. Please go ahead, take it away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I was on the last time too, but <clears throat> somehow I got muted. Anyway, no uh, well. our chapter is- yeah, our chapter is on emerging research devices, and um, you, you, a revised version has been on the web uh, at least for the last six months, and I hope you get a chance to take a look at it. Uh, next slide, Denise. <clears throat> um, so, you know, the motivation is uh, the scaling, uh, obviously, as we all know, you know, has, you know, reached its fundamental limit and uh, it's very hard to achieve um, increasing the speed, you know, while simultaneously lowering the power consumption. And uh, so that uh, gives rise to the need, you know, to explore new devices for a variety of applications, you know, information processing, memory, architecture, everything. So, so the, the our uh, chapter scope includes supporting all the uh, you know working groups with new devices as they require you know to meet uh, the difficult challenges you know each one of them you know identify. So in that sense, you know we need to work with the, uh, you know several of the um, you know twigs. And um, uh, next slide, please. So we have identified about. 14 or 15 um, emerging research devices. Obviously, we haven't covered all of them yet. You know, it, it will probably take uh, you know three years or so to do all you know 14 of them. So we have done about seven. Uh, in the eight minutes I have, I'm not going to be able to talk about all of them. So uh, I'm going to cover uh, <clears throat> some of the items which are highlighted in blue color here. And uh, next slide, please. Um, so graphene electronics and other things, uh, I'll be able to say a couple of words, okay? So now without further ado, let me go into the uh, first thing that I wanna talk about. Next slide. <clears throat> Nanoscale vacuum electronics. In the last three or four years, there has been a lot of work in the US and in other countries on nanoscale vacuum electronics, you know, funded by NSF and funded by AFOSR and many other agencies. And, uh, and DARPA has funded uh, these in for quite a while too. So the advantages are in speed and um, uh, obviously you know, radiation resistant. And um, the recent efforts have focused on one thing. What it is is um, you know, making them as small as uh, you know, silicon CMOS, okay? So reducing the critical dimensions and completely using uh, integrated circuit you know, manufacturing techniques and uh, you know, wafer level fabrication, uh, generally eight inch wafers. So the smallest vacuum devices that have been made, uh, they feature um, source drain distance of only um, uh, you know, 50 nanometers and uh, uh, with the surround gate. And that is actually remarkable. You know, vacuum devices have never been made uh, as small. And um, the lowest driving voltage that has been accomplished is less than two volts. Uh, and even very early devices have uh, shown SFT something as, <clears throat> as high as uh, you know, half a terahertz. So those are some of the things that people have shown so far. And um, so what are the limitations? You know, next slide, please. Um, the overcoming the child Langmuir space charge limited you know, channel current. And uh, so that is uh, 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 the focus of the community right now. Uh, and people continue to work on 
low voltage operation, you know, trying to run these devices less than one volt, uh, but not compromising the channel current. And um, the surround gate basically helps with good electrostatic control and helps to bring down the voltage. And um, obviously availability of CMOS like circuits um, is very hard because uh, uh, vacuum electronics has only electrons only. And, but this is needed for low standby power. Um, next slide, please. Recently, there was a proposal um, to have a complementary uh, type operation in vacuum electronics. In the absence of holes, you can have complementary operation only if you have an external mechanism that is combined with the field emission. Uh, Nanoelectromechanical actuation of the gate you know, to modulate the channel current uh, uh, with the aid of gate voltage is that mechanism. You know, that has been proposed recently and complementary operation and circuits have been you know, shown by simulation, but the fabrication is pending. Okay? So, so much on you know, vacuum electronics and I want to quickly move on to um, uh, uh, next uh, slide, please, on neuromorphic devices. So this one potentially can solve one of the greatest challenges of heterogeneous integration, which is power consumption. And um, achieving power levels uh, in a, anywhere near that of brain, that would be a game changer. So the challenges the community are addressing is um, uh, lack of understanding of algorithms for signal processing, okay? Uh, but what is not clear is, is, is the operation even based on algorithms? You know, that's not even clear. So the absence of models needed you know, to implement the algorithms and complete the neuromorphic designs. You know, so that's the biggest challenge. There is a lot of work going on. And uh, so this is something that, you know, we have covered in chapter in, in a great level of detail, okay? And uh, uh, let's skip the next slide and, um, and then let's go to the next one after. Uh, I wanna say something about 2D material devices, including graphene. And, um, and so here again, the motivation is to enhance the speed while lowering the power consumption. Um, so that way it could be an alternative to, to silicon. But the problem is actually with graphene, opening a band gap while maintaining high mobility is an issue. The mobility band gap trade-off is a fundamental problem. And um, uh, so the graphene nano ribbons in a seem to offer some help, but there is no clear advantage over conventional semiconductors because the exact placement of the large number of you know, graphene nano ribbons uh, at the predefined location seems to be very difficult. They also need alignment, so that, that seems to be an issue. Uh, moving along, um, uh, even, there are a lot of other 2D materials. Um, and that none of them seem to have any advantage over, uh, you know, silicon. For example, the saturation velocities are worse than silicon. And uh, um, so, uh, you know, these are the handicaps of the 2D materials, including, you know, graphene or facing. So we have covered uh, in our chapter, you know, what progress the community has made and what challenges they are facing and some kind of a prognosis, you know, where we think they will land, okay? So, so uh, you know, that has been, you know, covered in detail in, in the chapter. So that brings me to the last item that I want to cover. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this has got some overlap with what Mark talked about, you uh, know, a couple of talks ago, uh, you know, wearables. Uh, so the flexible and stretchable electronics, it's a prime example of heterogeneous integration. Um, the community has worked on a lot of things, logic and memory electronics, sensors, actuators, antennas. Uh, antennas are the you know, most investigated flexible device, RF devices, and um, yeah, yeah, flexible batteries and flexible supercapacitors and many other things. Uh, so obviously the advantages are, um, these are in you know, a wide range of functional devices and um, we can use a, a wide variety of functional materials, a uh, range of substrates, including flexible and stretchable. Uh, we can customize them in a mass fashion. Uh, the most important advantage of flexible electronics is the rapid prototyping and iteration and uh, low mass, you know, low cost devices. And, um, um, you know, some of the, next slide please. Some of the challenges are right now, 
the resolution is pretty low, okay? And the yield also is kind of low and, uh, you know, control is lacking, uh, uh, all of that. And um, so these are the challenges that the, the community is, is working on. Uh, so our flexible electronic, you know, section is very detailed and we cover a, a, a large ground in terms of applications and, and issues. I just want to throw in one cartoon as the last slide. You know, next slide, please. So this is the kind of vision the flexible electronics community has, okay? It's a vision, it's not ready yet, but hopefully in the next few years, the ability to integrate a, you know, a number of different components, functional components on a large area of flexible substrate. You can see you know, sensors and symptom circuits. Um, uh, you can generate the power using a small solar cell, and then you can store the power using supercapacitor or, or batteries, uh, all of these things. So, so this is a, a you know, glimmer in our eyes right now, but hopefully, um, um, uh, in the future, in the, in the near future, probably within the five years, you know, some rudimentary demonstration of uh, a, a, a few functional components on large area substrates. Excellent. So uh, that's excellent. pretty much what it is. So the next slide is just uh, shows the names of all our TWID members. And uh, so with that, I will stop right here. Thanks, Amir. No pleasure. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. So this is the... Uh, single chip and uh, multi-chip integration. And uh, Annette and Annette Tan and myself are chairs and co-chair. Next slide, please. So we have, um, we have uh, uh, 14 sections in the, in the chapter, but actually the, uh, actually it is the 12 sections starting from electrical requirements, thermal, mechanical, and then we have wafer, wafer singulation, flip chip. So now if you look at this, it is essentially what a company who want to do packaging, they need to know all, they need to know all these things, starting from electrical and end up with reliability. Next slide, please. These are the contributors and uh, um, that covers all of this. Uh, different chapters. Next slide, please. Um, so starting with electrical um, requirements. And uh, so let's we'll start with signal integrity challenges, but let's see the next slide. Okay, so we have a very important table, which is the electrical requirements. It's very difficult to see right now because I, I doubt how many of us has good eyesight? But this is a very important table that lists all the electrical requirements from single to multi-chip from, from a um, perspective. It shows memory, that shows high performance computing. And this is the, a table that originally was used in the ITRS roadmap. Next slide, please. And then we have a table on warpage that shows the allowable uh, for the uh, mobile and allowable for high performance computing. And we show some of the effects of uh, uh, warpage um, that could be monitored. Uh, if you look at the, the figure on the left, that could be monitored over a reflow cycle. Next slide, please. We also have a table on flip chip interconnects and uh, um, that shows the flip chip pitch for large body size um, for the copper pillar. And then we also show some for the chiplets. Next slide, please. Ah, wire bond. So we have a section on wire bond and remembering that 85% um, of the worldwide devices are being assembled on wire bond. So we showed the, a table on wire bond uh, in the materials, uh, in the, uh, um, in the uh, number of loops and tiers, and then over, overhand capabilities and low low cap capabilities. On the right, you could see some of the examples of the wire bond. Next slide, please. On substrates, 
substrate is key for a driver and a key building block. So we have a section on substrate for chiplets and high speed and also for uh, integrated uh, for power delivery. Next slide, please. Um, we have a section on printed uh, additive manufacturing. And this we are in collaboration both with the emerging materials and power electronics that shows how we could do, um, do um, integrate uh, additive for printing passives. We think this is a great opportunity in terms of passives um, for both three dimensional as well as the uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, configurations. Next slide. Our reliability. Um, I mentioned yesterday that uh, um, when reliability um, section in the single motor chip, we are working with the uh, uh, team in the reliability sections to develop a white paper in with, a, with the perspective of uh, uh, moving them into a separate technical working group. We think the reliability is very important. Next slide. Next slide, please. Ah, so the reliability um, section, now we have developed a, a, a three, I should say three, multi-dimensional table for mechanisms for the hardware degradations and failure. And uh, we are looking forward to have this group, this, this table to be expanded. So this is a collaboration together with the uh, um, simulation um, trick, but I think it should be an area for collaboration with every trick because reliability is so important for us. Next slide, please. Electro migration. This is a, um, a section that uh, discuss how do we do wiring design for power grids so that uh, uh, electro migration reliability will no longer be as important or to say other way, it's, it's a way to design out the risk of uh, uh, natural migration. And uh, this section is led by Paul Ho. Next one. Okay, for the 2020 revision, we will be updating the tables and pie charts. We would include the global electronics industry projections. And we are looking at the drivers. And then we're looking at reliability fit Billion mechanism tables. We talk about additive manufacturing and the table for the electrical performance, wattage, thermal multi die. And we also will specifically talk about a chiplet integration, talking about wattage ideas, flip chip assembly ideas, reliability, and sector sections. And thermal sections, we have a collaboration with the thermal management chapter and why bond. It will be updated since it's still the most versatile and, and available for applications. Next slide. We think it's important to think about how do we use data, data acquisition, data analytics, and uh, we want to add that as a important part for the future editions of this chapter. That is all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Perfect. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. And we have um, last but most certainly not least uh, the modeling and simulation chapter. Chris, I think, will give us the um, rundown of that. Are you around, Chris? Uh, uh, this is modeling and simulation. And uh, maximize it uh, if you can. And uh, I'd like to thank my co chair, as well as you and Fan from Lamar University. Okay, the scope of the chapter, it covers uh, seven sections from electrical analysis to reliability and prognostics. And each chapter, each uh, section uh, discusses the current state of the art in modeling and simulation 
What are the challenges, particularly with regards to heterogeneous integration and is attempting to identify potential solutions to those challenges? Uh, highlights from 2020. Uh, if we look at modeling and simulation, uh, we can go from very detailed high fidelity type calculations, finite element methods or detailed computational fluid dynamics, all the way down to spice type models for electrical analysis. In uh, some of these uh, examples of challenges with regards to electrical, uh, the signal integrity, power integrity, uh, uh, crosstalk, uh, die to die coupling, having the capability to pr uh, predict accurately what, what's happening there, thermomechanical, predicting hotspots accurately, uh, understanding warpage. Uh, multi-physics, this is a very topical theme in this, uh, in this chapter, a multi-scale. We start thinking about chip package interactions, uh, transistor mobility shifts. Bill just mentioned migration. Uh, you know, how do we accurately predict that? Um, there's a lot of research out there today in, in looking at that, but it is inherently a multi-physics type problem. And of course, reliability. <clears throat> based on physics of failure. Um, what are those failure mechanisms and, and modes and how do we accurately predict reliability? And also new materials. How do we capture their variability? And generally, how do we capture variability inside simulation uh, so we can predict uh, accurately what's happening? Um, so uh, this chart here, is looking at the different domains, electrical, optical, thermal, and mechanical. In the past, these interactions, they've always been there, but maybe they weren't so strong. But for heterogeneous integration, some of these interactions here between the physical domains are becoming much stronger, and hence that need for multi-physics or co-simulation capabilities. Bill also mentioned and this is a very exciting time with regards to the, the amount of data that could be coming from our products, both from manufacturing lines with Industry 4.0 and gathering data from the field. And how do we use that in modeling and simulation? In particular, to establish the knowledge base for heterogeneous integration, informing design rules, PDKs, ADKs. Multi-physics, multi-scale simulation. It's not just about understanding how a heterogeneous integrated product behaves in the field. It's also understanding the fabrication processes. And earlier we heard a bit about 3D printing, simulating 3D printing process, processes effectively. Bill mentioned migration. Uh, it's electro-migration, it's stress migration, it's thermal migration inherently a multi-physics problem. So uh, for multi-physics and multi-scale, it's understanding also interfaces, the chip package system inter interactions informed and optimized through co-simulation or multi-physics based simulations. I'd like to just say there are many tools out there that are used at the chip level, that at the package level, at the system level. How do we, transfer data effectively between these tool sets. Again, multi uh, physics of failure type reliability modeling, it is inherently multi-physics, but what are those failure models that we should be using for heterogeneous integrated products? And we heard a fair bit about AI and machine learning. This is a very interesting area and it will significantly affect modeling and simulation in the future. Um, so how do we integrate AI machine learning with the physics-based simulation tools uh, that we would traditionally use today? And we also hear a lot about something called the digital twin for heterogeneous integrated electronic components and modules and, and through to systems. Um, so at the point I'd like to raise here is 
in the future, I, I sort of visualize every package will have a digital twin to that package. When a company sells its package, it sells the digital twin with that package. A systems house will want to do modeling and simulation with that packaged digital twin. This sort of happens today in the thermal world. We could think of things like Delphi models, where a package could be shipped with a thermal equivalent model that can be plug and played inside a system thermal uh, analysis tool. Could we do that for stress? That'd be very interesting. The 2021 edition, uh, I'd just like to say to Paul Wesley, that is page one. I haven't got the other 17 pages yet. Uh, but uh, we're working, we're starting to work on and give some thoughts to the 2021 edition. We will expand and revise current sections. We have not got much in the chapter at the moment on uh, photonics and optical analysis. That will be added. There will also be a section now on AI and machine learning techniques and how that can be embedded within a, a, a modeling and simulation environment. We have some cross linkages already through Twigs. How are we doing that? It's essentially some of our members are also members on other Twigs. Uh, and that is uh, 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 engaging cross communication between the Twigs. So that's really good to see. Finally, I'd like to say thank you to all the Twig members uh, for their efforts in, in pulling together the, the current version of the chapter. Um, modeling and simulation is very much about taking the research from the universities and research institutes, working with tool vendors, and just like to pick up the point Jose made about, you know, we need to engage more with tool vendors uh, in this chapter. And of course, providing this capability uh, for, for industry. We welcome. Uh, new participants, please contact myself, Oswey Jun. And also, there'll be a much bigger discussion at, on modeling and simulation at the upcoming Eurosim conference, uh, which will be held online. And I'll just, uh, I'll just place that uh, URL uh, there for you to, to look at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think there is a... Um... A question for Jose from uh, KK Lin, who uh, from Advanced Materials, is co-design efforts similar to uh, STCO, System Technology Co-Optimization, is something like TSMC iMac, uh, is it something like uh, uh, STCO, which is TSMC and iMac are promoting? I'm not familiar with STCO, can you elaborate? Uh, okay, so would you... Um, um, uh, Dr. Lin, would you like to give us maybe a, a reply to that to explain briefly so perhaps Jose can reply? He's not familiar with STCO. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, actually, actually STCO is um, something that evolved from the chip design world, the DTCO, design technology co-optimization. So basically try to uh, optimize all the entitlements uh, from uh, materials to uh, a system. Um, so I, I think um, I think that terminology has been kind of emerging from iMac and uh, TSMC. Mm -hmm. uh, but after listening to the talk, um, yeah, this is my first time here. Um, uh, thanks for the, the workshop and symposium, very great. Um, so I think STCO may be more similar to what Chris just uh, presented. Um, yeah. Um, on the, we on could the definitely and... benefit from that. We could right. definitely benefit from that. So how mm -hmm. do you? How do you? Can you link us to, to this forum? Uh yes, yes. I, I can send some some of the links from iMac and uh, and yeah. I, so so yeah, I can send it out. Great. The link, right? Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. NPK, this is Puneet here. I hey, 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 Puneet. Hi, Puneet. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Puneet. Hey. Uh, hey, KK. Uh, so the STCO work um, is, yeah, as KK is pointing out, is extension of the DTCO work. So in terms of what I think we, uh, you have in the co-design chapter right now, the closest cousin to it is, I think, what you're calling is pathfinding. 
Mm. Okay. Uh, I see. I see. Uh, so it's just pathfinding, but going not stopping at chip package, but going one level up. I see. Okay. I see. Good. 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 Thanks, Puni. Thanks a lot, Puni. Sure. Thanks for jumping in. Sure. We have another uh, question for Jose. Uh, from Ravi, okay. and the question is: Can you comment on the on the pace at which algorithms developed in academic research are adopted by design tool vendors? How much time does this take? The adoption, that is, and what, if anything, needs to be done to ease this transition to use the new algorithms and product designs that is developed uh, academically? Um, yeah, that this is a very interesting question. Uh, what I will say is that, from my observation, it takes a much longer time for algorithms to mature than it takes for technology. When you think of it, the algorithms we're working on right now are things like macro modeling, model order reduction, and they've been around for the past 20 years and they still have not matured to the point where they are fully robust. Uh, there's been a lot of improvement, but, but uh, and, and of course, it's only now, it's only recently for the past five, six years that these, these modeling techniques that have been pioneered at universities are, are really finding uh, their application in EDA tools. So the process is really slow. It usually takes 10, 15 years for, for the technology to develop, to mature, and then to transition into commercial tools. Uh, and I, the I question is, if there's something can be done to, to actually expedite that? I guess more investment, more research, uh, because when you think of it, they, there's not very many people doing research in, the, in, in algorithm development, actually. And I mean, for instance, one example is that if you look at SPICE, SPICE is the, is the, uh, is, is the standard for doing circuit simulation. But when you look at the history of SPICE, SPICE was developed in Berkeley, University of California in Berkeley in 1969, and then it came out at, in, uh, in the mid 70s. But so far, when you think of it, SPICE is the, is the only thing that's out there for doing circuit simulation. It's been like every company has their own version of SPICE. There have been modification to the basic Berkeley code, but in essence, it is all SPICE. So now what can be done? I would say more research and more investment in, in, uh, in uh, design tools in, and, and the same thing can be said about uh, electromagnetic simulation or ele electromagnetic modeling. Uh, there's a big challenge there, like when you have a package, a multi-layer package, and the problems are becoming more complex because you have all these layers and interactions, electromagnetic interactions that are far more significant when the, when the bandwidth and the frequencies go up, but they are not, there's not much out there uh, to to model electromagnetic uh, 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 electromagnetic effects, uh, so so it, it, the answer is simple. We need more uh, manpower, more investment in in the discipline. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rabbi, I guess Chris Chris could comment comment on that. Uh, yeah, just just some thoughts on my experience. Um, uh, 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 Jose mentioned that Spice came out of Berkeley. Uh, if you think about computational fluid dynamics uh, and, the, and the flow therm guys, I'm in a conference, G -Jong, so I can't speak here. That all came out of Imperial College in London. I'm really sorry. Uh, and finite element analysis, that all came out of universities as well. I, I think what really speeds this up for industrial use is where we have these collaborations uh, between uh, industry. And, and the universities on projects. I did mention the Delphi type models that are used in thermal analysis. That was a European project that involved a number of universities and, and companies, as well as a tool vendor. Uh, so those types of projects, if you can get NSF funding those types, I think they do in the States, but those types of joint industry uh, and university type projects, when it comes to algorithms, can speed those algorithms up into into industry. But you've got to have the tool vendors involved as well, of course. Yeah, I you know I asked this for a specific reason. We I was part of an I've been part of an EDA conference the last two years, and if I listen to a lot of the folks there, they seem to think everything is seem to think that everything is hunky dory, everything's working fine. <laughs> so. I, you know, in fact, yeah. quite a bit of the conference promoted the advancements in tools like ANSYS, as you know, has an adjunct in doing EM simulation. And I was listening to it with slight disbelief. 
you know, um, what, what's been happening in the tool vendor domain, uh, from my perspective, there's been a lot of uh, uh, companies buying out other companies. So ANSYS has really become multi-physics because it's bought yep. a, a lot of other tools and then it's integrating those within its own environment. There is um, also this um, idea that uh, EDA, electronic design automation, is not as big an industry as it should be, and it does not get the respect that it deserves. Like for instance, I mean, when you think of it, EDA is probably is less than the twenty billion dollar industry, mm -hmm. and it supports the whole semiconductor industry, which is more than three hundred billion dollars. So uh, there's this thought that it does not get the attention that and the respect that it deserves. Yeah. No, how to do it, I don't know. But if the value proposition of predictive modeling and the ability to do better design choices earlier can accelerate the speed at which development happens, then, you know, this whole paradigm could change. How to do it, I don't know. But uh, yeah. Yeah, that's something we ought to think about. Yeah. And, and that, 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 that's the big question, isn't it? Because that's where industry really takes notice. If this gets my product to market in six months instead of 12 months, yeah. And it's a winner. Absolutely. I have to invest in this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but there, there is a question coming up about the accuracy of these models. Um, uh, of course, that's that all depends on how modeling and simulation integrates with metrology. And there's some exciting developments going on there as well. Yeah. Uh, hi, Chris. Uh, this is Mudusir from Google. One, one quick question. Uh, is your working group also looking at some startups that are trying to break into the EDA space? whether it's in terms of small EDA tools or, you know, customized two and a half D, 3D packaging or cloud-based type business models that can help counter the weight of some of the consolidated players that have sort of owned the entire market. We're, we're not at the moment, but that's an interesting point. And uh, I, I think Jose and I may, it'll be interesting to know a little bit more about that because I think the voice of those types of startups uh, could be good to hear within those twigs. Great, okay, I'll connect with you offline. I'd appreciate that, thank you. So this is Bill Chen, I have a question um, in t for Jose and also for Chris, is that uh, the packaging aspects of the modeling and design as we go into more and more um, sophisticated packages. So what do you see is the capabilities that we have today? And what do you see is the way to, um, to catch up with the capabilities as, we, as the new um, assembly devices, new methods are being developed? Jose, would you like to ask? Uh, what I do is I look, I look at packaging from the signal integrity perspective. Um, the density is increasing, frequency and bandwidth is going up. So uh, the electromagnetic effects becomes a lot more difficult to capture and to model. So there are tools out there, but you know, it's always this catch up game that they have to play. Like, like when things go to from five gigabits per second to 10 gigabits per second, the modeling and, and the, the becomes a lot more challenging. So it, it's, it's this constant, you know, catch up game that we, we are playing in, in terms of, you know, what happens when the frequency gets to be higher. Now, if you look at it from a, from a simple perspective, you know, you're transmitting signal on the waveguide, but at higher frequencies, you get these higher order mode, there's more noise, more ugly things happening in the transmission. And we need to be able to predict that. And, and that's essentially what, you know, packaging for signal integrity is all about. Your ground at higher frequency is not as good a ground as it is at low frequencies because it has, there's the skin effect that shows up. There, there are things like surface roughness that you have to account for. Uh, you don't worry about these problems at the lower frequencies, let's say one, two gigahertz, but the minute you get to 10, 12 gigahertz, surface roughness becomes important. Fiber weave is also a critical uh, it's a serious problem and, 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 and it reflects things like differential signaling. So, and, and the tools are not there in the sense that they, they are still, you know, there's a lot of research being done that has not yet been integrated into the commercial tools. 
Yeah, I agree with, with Jose. I think my, my EDA friends kept telling me that they're always catching up. So I think the issue is that for my personal thought is that there are too many variants in the, the packaging, architecture, and platforms. Yeah, I think that may be also one, one reason, right? Actually, I can, I can quantify it. I think EDA tools are six to 10 years behind. Uh, if you look at the SRC research that was done, uh -huh. and uh, you know UIUC and other schools have done tremendous amount of work in these areas, the tools are six to eight years behind, six to ten years behind. Well, yeah. I I was thinking about the conversation. I'm thinking about a conversation that uh, John Hunt had with Cebu. Now, if we are thinking about a chipless situation, let, let's just think about. The chipless situation, maybe there's uh, six of them or eight of them. And if one of them, if a few of them are misaligned, and John talked about it takes 30 seconds for us to, to understand what that misalignment and how much to correct. If we have a way in which we understand the differences in 30 seconds in terms of performance, then it would be a very nice thing to have. How much we can correct and how much we can accept. And yeah. that's, that's a kind of, kind of need that, we're, that I could see that, uh, that the process engineer, manufacturing engineer would love to have. Yeah. And, and that type of parametric analysis, Bill, and, 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 you know, that could, but it needs to be informed by manufacturing it needs to understand the simulations need to understand what the process window is as such in doing a parametric analysis like that to understand the impact of any tolerance shift uh, or misalignment of, of a certain die but if you look at a whole number of die or chiplets like that that is a big big simulation but you would want to run many many calculations and that takes a lot of time today so how do we run these simulations quicker and still keep the accuracy? Well, you see, it's not just simulation. It is, it is learning. If we can learn and accumulate the knowledge, and then That's... we could go faster and faster. We don't, yeah. have, we don't have to have start from zero every time. No, no it, it, exactly, Bill. And... Uh, I, I was speaking to a UK company two years ago, and, and they said to me, they said, Chris, we've got uh, terabytes of this data, 10 years of test data and assembly, all sitting in the back room. We have to keep it. Can you, can you use some of these new techniques now that people are talking about? Go mine that data and generate knowledge. And then my question is, is how we add that knowledge to the current modeling and simulations capability. But Bill, what you're picking up on there is what you mentioned in your presentation. How do we use AI and machine learning today with the other tools that we have? And that, that relates very much to modeling and simulation. Well, we are the people that help the AI semiconductor people to make their products. We are the people who enable many of those. But at the same time, we need to ask ourselves how do we use it for ourselves? That means that every one of our groups need to think about to recruit the right data science people to help us into our group. Yeah. yeah. And Bill, that is a section we will have in the next edition of the, the chapter. That's high priority. So Chris, Bill, and Jose, I just wanted to add a small thing here since we're talking about uh, technology transfer from academia to industry taking way too long, uh, at least partly. Uh, at least in EDA, one thing that has helped in the last decade or so substantially is uh, uh, open sourcing of uh, public release of benchmarks from industry. Yeah. Uh, and the second is a strong incentive on academia to uh, have open source code bases which are available. And uh, there's a very strong push recently from DARPA to have an open source EDA platform. Uh, but before that also, this has been going on at least in some subsections of uh, 
ADA, especially physical design. And that's where the technology transfer has been relatively quick mm. uh, to industry. Uh, yeah. Because industry sponsored benchmarks, which they release so that the academia is not working in vacuum. Mm. And uh, then the results were very, very quickly ported over to quote unquote commercial ADA methodologies. Mm. So, so something to just keep in mind that uh, uh, of course, funding always helps, but in addition to funding, uh, uh, something like this can also be very, very valuable to for the technology transfer to be quicker. And there's actually three aspects to it. There is the design, there is the manufacturability, and there is the reliability. And I should point out that there is an effort now by a group of people in EM to do a few canonical designs that, uh, you know, the EPS is sponsoring this. Uh, it, it, th those kind of canonical designs will go to exactly what Puneet said. Uh, start showing people how can we in real life design uh, solutions that make sense. And it took us two to three yeah. years to bypass all the IP concerns with all the member companies who were participating in this design. Yeah. Uh, so I think we've... Yeah, sorry, Ravi. Uh, no, no, I said we, we've, we have come up with a problem that is sort of a consensus problem, but it'll be a good case study. And I don't know if Dale Becker's online, but- I, Dale I was just gonna me. ask if Carl's there because yep. uh, yes, I know what you're, but, uh, so one of our technical uh, committees in EPS, uh, uh, they are putting benchmarks on the, yep. the electrical yes. domain, uh, electrical design TC. Yep. Uh, is is Dow there? Would he like to comment on this? Uh, no, Dell uh, told me that he may not be able to join. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, but anyhow, no, just picking up on what uh, Ravi said there, um, uh, and I, I think it's an excellent idea, producing these benchmarks uh, for electrical design and placing those on the, uh, on the website. Uh, Chris, I, I, I am familiar with the with the yeah. packaging benchmark forum. In fact, I'm, I maintain the website for it. And uh, yes, I, I agree. Uh, but the challenge that we get is that it is very difficult to get companies to contribute to it. Like, for instance, yeah. we need the data. Like, like, for instance, we had a call for data a month ago where we need high speed link uh, results, you know, like input outputs. We don't need to know all the, you know, we're not interested in knowing the proprietary information. Just put the data out there. And there's a lot of machine learning research that's taking place for which that data would be extremely valuable. But the, the challenge there is to get somebody from, from a company or, you know, to go and generate the data or collect the measurements. But, but I, you know, it, 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 we, but however, we all recognize that having it there would be extremely useful for the research community. Hi, uh, Ravi. Uh, yes. Uh, Reggie. Uh, you know, uh, Jose, I, I would have to say that there are some uh, companies like ANSYS and so on that also work with uh, academia, like uh, at, at the POITS program from Illinois, you know, folks at Arkansas work very closely with, uh, with ANSYS and so on to kind of uh, short circuit uh, uh, that, uh, that time it takes for, for code. And I, I know, for example, we've developed uh, a methodology for solving uh, uh, reliability of solder where instead of having a whole array, we did a compact model. We only sh used a few significant timing. In fact, well, my, that student right now, he's at uh, Qualcomm. And so there is ways of doing things, if you, yeah. but to me, developing codes in academia just does not make sense. Then it would take a long time. You have to develop it and pass it to industry. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult for industry to adapt it. You know, I was suggesting algorithm development. I fully agree with you that, uh, I mean, you should do basic code to demonstrate the algorithm, but uh, once the algorithm itself is validated, uh, that but, I but there's, also, there's also the fact that the EDA vendors uh, for the most part, especially the big ones, they are very happy with the customer base that they have and their, their focus is satisfying that customer base. And if you try to get them interested in something like machine learning, for instance, which is, which is mm -hmm. new, you will see that the reaction is that they are very timid about it. Yeah. And, 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 and again, you know, it comes back to what Ravi said. It may, take, it may be like six, seven years before something comes out of university and they say, well, fine, this one, we've tested it, it's robust, so we can commercialize it. But mm -hmm. yet, if, if they could somehow integrate it as, as you know, quicker than that, then of course, you know, you would have solutions that, that could be, you know, could be very useful. 
Yeah. Maybe beta. <laughs> yeah. So, so Ravi so, and Bill, yeah. Uh, uh, I think all the more reason why we need some of these vendors, uh, tool vendors involved in this road mapping operation because yes. they are invested in that roadmap. They have confidence in how to right. plan ahead and invest in their R and their own internal R and D. I think yeah. that'll shorten that uh, gap a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to point to another example. You know, in this uh, the people who do backend silicon wires always tell you that they can predict the electro migration in wires very easily. But when you take the same phenomenon and try and do it in solders, which are heterogeneous, they have dimensional effects and interface effects, uh, it's very difficult to extrapolate. And people take Black's law and just fit curves in there. So, you know, the S yeah, it does not work. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't work. <laughs> and SRC, a few years ago, funded a program to study the physics. And I thought the SRC did a tremendous job in coming up with, uh, you know, PIs who studied the physics of what happens. But today, that has not been translated into a tool that anybody can take and predict the electro migration in a solder joint. And that's yeah. because there's a gap between the mm -hmm. physics and the implementation. Right. Right. So uh, that actually goes back to a question Bill Chen asked a short while ago. You just said, okay, systems of chiplets. That question was for Chris. How complex is that a problem? On the one hand, you're getting to uh, longer and longer length scales because you've got more and more systems packed into a single multi-chip system. But the flip side of it is that the features individually are now so tiny, you're down to defect scales of, as Ravi said, in, in your solder joints or in your copper structures or any of your other structures, you're down to defect scale physics. How do you capture the defect scale physics that requires almost molecular scale understanding and modeling into very complex system level models across you know, uh, orders of magnitudes of length scales? Chris, that's been a big challenge, obviously. How do you make compact models of these defects that you can implant into yeah, defective properties yeah. at higher length scales, right? The yeah. homogenization, multi-scale homogenization. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and Chris, I also asked you, what about material characterization? Material property, your, your modeling is as good as the material properties. So how are you integrating that in your? Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a message I, keep saying strongly, and as I think you say in America, garbage in, garbage out, um, and that's not the case, I, uh, but, uh, and I, I remember uh, about 15 years ago, NIST held a workshop in New Orleans, and I was invited there, and it was to talk about, it, it was bringing metrology people to, uh, with modelers, and they were asking, what do you want us to measure? What do we need to capture so your modeling is more accurate? And I thought that was a great initiative. I'd like to see more of that. Um, uh, because we do, it, numerous times we, we're given packages to simulate and the same question, what's the CTE? Oh, it's this. Yeah, but how does it change with temperature? No one knows. Oh, okay, what's the modulus? Well, it's always the same at one temperature. Well, no, it's going to vary. Including uh, so, the companies. The companies themselves don't have the data. Well, some of, you might be, some of them do, but it comes very, they spend a lot of money generating it. So they kind of keep it. Well, some do. Um, and, and you're looking at like an initiative, a government initiative, I guess, or, where they can generate this data and make it available to the community. I mean, it just benefits everyone. Um, but you're absolutely right, sir. And this is going to be important in the future, having accurate data. We can learn a lot from data that's monitored by industry with machine learning, but having accurate creep models and materials data that's temperature dependent, yes, it, 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 it will be important. Well, it's not just the materials, it's the surfaces. Surfaces, but, I yeah. think if you listen to uh, Ken Goodson's presentation on the first day, he was talking about how important are the surfaces just for the thermal properties. Right. Yeah. The inter interfaces. Yeah. Interfaces. Yeah. Yeah. For everything, electrical, thermal, mechanical, for yeah. everything, the interfaces yeah. are super yeah. important. Yeah. And, but surfaces is also something that we can manage. So we need to understand how do we do surface engineering. It's Shabek like Gromala here from Bosch. I would like to add one more point regarding material characterizations and modeling. I mean, we actually pretty well can measure material properties in the pristine stage. 
But when we think about the liability aspects, and especially when we have those uh, complex, let's say, components in the system, in the field, I mean, these materials properties, I mean, change over time, yeah? And I think one of the big next challenge in respect to the material characterization modeling is actually how to consider those changes within the, 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 the uh, time when material is or components actually used already in the field, mm. specifically when we think about also, uh, let's say, kind of condition monitoring and digital team. Yeah. This will be also a very big challenge. Yep. Yeah. Well, I think everybody knows this, but uh, in complex structures, the interfaces dominate what ha what happens. Mm -hmm. It's not the bulk of any of the components. Right. Right. It's all the interfaces. So, so um, from reliability uh, <clears throat> perspectives, I think from modeling the, the um, does play an important role. But uh, we 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 see some limitations, right? Because modeling simulations uh, can provide an accident stress and strain on all those distributions. But to get to the next step is like uh, how to uh, leverage this data to actually predict the failure. Like the time to failure and where the location of the failure, that is still quite a big challenge. Um, so I don't know if that compact model can solve this problem, but I oh, think- Hi, like Richard. <laughs> uh, the, the compact model, it, that's like a vision. Uh, Cause I see this happening today with these compact thermal models. And, and, and the, the vision there is how do we, how do we transfer models across our supply chain as such, you know, but without losing any intellectual property, which is what Delphi compact models in the thermal domain do. And they're fairly accurate for thermal. Could we be doing something similar for stress? Um, you know, it's like a grand challenge because uh, stress calculations are probably, you know, the most time consuming calculations uh, that, that we undertake. Yeah, I just want I to know. say that, uh, um, sorry, uh, from from industrial perspective, I think a more uh, practical uh, approach. Actually, we use we call it a hybrid uh, methodology. Basically, you take some um, modeling results, uh, but uh, we know that to um, to predict that uh, the time to failure look into failure from the data is not there, but we can um, run the, some the experiments also to, to actually get the practical data, then try to correlate uh, the modeling data with that your actual testing data and see if yeah. you can build up certain uh, correlation there. And yeah. at least to be not very accurate, but maybe in a practical methodology. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, yeah go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I was gonna say, Richard, that's also been the big tussle about uh, time to for de development time, right? Experiments will take so much longer, and the dream is that if we can do some of that with simulation in much faster time, that would be great. Mm -hmm. But of course, as Chris says, we're not there yet. But that's that's the grand challenge: is how much of the experimentation can we uh, uh, supplement with with uh, uh, numerical simulations? So. so I want to I want to mention that Avajit and uh, um, Richard, they are the two people. Who are the core? The who are the core for the uh, um, the white paper for the reliability trick? So look at their faces. Remember that. <laughs> oh, there you go. Richard, turn on your video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, no, uh, I just want to say uh, this workshop was very useful again because of these cross uh, twig interactions, and now that. Uh, we're in a similar role ourselves at Twig of our own soon. Uh, we'll be building liaison because like, like materials, like supply chain, uh, like many other topics, uh, like test, like many other topics, reliability is cross-cutting. We get affected and we affect every activity of every Twig. So I'll be reaching out for liaison members. So as we build our team, the reliability team, a big part of it will be finding liaison members to each of your Twigs that are, we are going to interact with. Um, so uh, including in the application domains, because that's really where the re reliability is, as Bill likes to say, it's application driven and the reliability goals, the, the cost of ensuring reliability is going to be a different answer for different application domains. So we're going to have to be driven by them. They are the end customer. So we'll be building 
connections and liaison members with all of these. I, I have a suggestion, Bill. Uh, yeah. yeah, the you know now that we have the decadal plan, now that there is fairly good acknowledgement that heterogeneous integration is critical for performance, maybe chapter one with inputs from everybody should try and translate uh, all the output of all, all our work into here is what we need to do as our big challenges to respond to say the decadal challenge or whatever. And you know, focus on things like modeling, uh, material characterization, as a life for reliability for design and put out a few same deal with materials for almost anything for manufacturability and say here is what we need to do my feeling is that that will help people translate our ask into uh, tangible research or tangible action mm -hmm. moving mm -hmm. forward and that i think will be a really good value of our work i think this is extremely important and uh, um going back is that we talk about EDA vendors. And uh, I think it's that if we can show that this will help them to, to sell more of their, um, of their products. If we can show mm -hmm. that by knowing the uh, tools in a more practical way for industry, and they will get more seats to be sold. I think yeah. these are very, very important for us to do. So one of the things that, the suggestion. I'm sorry, one of the things that perhaps we should do as, as a roadmap activity, and that is for each of the technical working groups to put in the beginning of their chapter uh, what they believe the 10 most difficult challenges are yeah. uh, that's holding them back and just focus on those 10 and and hopefully they'll they'll move. You know, the ones that are the worst will get solved, and the others, the others will creep up. But I think that would give us some focus, uh, and we could easily share it if it's just ten items. Yeah, and if you if you really bring out, I, I, you know, I, I listen with great interest this NSF discussion. If you bring out the science, the real scientific challenges there, then maybe NSF would start thinking, mm -hmm. we need to get universities to work on this. Yeah, I, I think big picture, you're right, Chris. The, not just the HIR, but HIR will be a big part of how the EPS states what we will do to move forward. You know, mm -hmm. like I'm almost tired of playing defense. We probably ought to do more 